cool. I'm up on my box now and all of maybe 5-4, so I think I'll go ahead and get started. So uh, my talk today is Don't Call Them Whales, uh, Free-to-Play Spenders and Virtual Value. Um, if you don't know me, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Congregate. And if you don't know Congregate, it is a, a to start with, a browser, a, a web platform for browser games um, on the web. So uh, think YouTube for games. We get uh, just a ton of content, about 1,300 new games per month, uh, 95,000 games total across a really wide variety of genres. And um, this gives us a with that ton of games, it gives us some interesting opportunities to do a lot of interesting research. And I am a big data geek, as you will discover quickly in this talk. Um, so I think that's really fun. Uh, about uh, most of the data in this talk will be from the web. Um, but about 18 months ago, we started publishing games on mobile, um, and we've published about 15 games in that time period. Now, that's not sort of the reach and breadth and depth of data we have from the web, but we've gotten more than 35 million installs and a bunch of titles in the top grossing. Um, so there's a lot of interesting data there, too. Um, so uh, um, give you a concept. Give you, I'll be using both in this talk. So one of the dirty secrets of Congregate is that we depend very heavily on 2% of our players. In 2000, we launched our virtual goods in-app purchasing on our platform about six years ago in, at the end of 2008. And since that time period, 2.1% of accounts active have purchased virtual goods. And those 2% have um, buying have brought in 75% of the revenue on Congregate. The other 25% comes from advertising. And the uh, and, that, and that split has increased over the years. So in 2014, 85% of our revenue came from virtual goods and just 15% from advertising. And if you look closer, it's actually much, much more concentrated than that. So um, this looks at, uh, takes a look at our buyers uh, from since 2008 on congregate.com. And on the left-hand chart, you, it splits them out um, splits all the spenders out by the amount they spent lifetime on the Congregate platform. So you can see that about a little more than 50% um, have spent less than $10, um, and about 4% 4 have spent $500 or more. Um, on the right-hand side, and did I get my left and right confused because that sometimes happens to me? No, it's right. Um, the, on the right-hand side, you've got the same split looking at the percent of revenue coming from that ca category of buyers. And the 54% uh, who spent less than t $10 uh, represent exactly 1% of our total revenue in the last six years. And the 4% of people uh, who have spent $500 or more are 72% of our revenue. So if you multiply 4% by 2%, that's 0.1% um, of our player base is representing half of our revenue. If you look at ind individual games, it's the same story. So this is the uh, top eight grossing games on Congregate during 2014, looking at their revenue distribution by spender category. So that same chart on the right that I looked at um, from the previous account. Um, if you can't read it, the bright green, um, it represents the revenue from uh, spenders who spent more than $500. And you can see that six out of eight games um, uh, get the majority of their revenue from, the vast majority of their revenue from people who spent more than $500. And all eight get the, ma the clear majority of their revenue from people who spent $100 or more. On mobile, the, the pattern is similar. Um, here are our top five grossing games on mobile um, broken out the same way. The spend is a little bit more distributed for a couple of reasons. One is that the games haven't been out as long, and the longer that they're, you're, you're out, the more that you're going to get concentration of spend in people who are playing for a long time. But the other factor is genre. Uh, on the web, our top grossing games are, are pretty dominated by MMORPGs and collectible card games, and on mobile, um, we've deliberately diversified um, a little bit more beyond that. But 
if you look at the same games, most of, quite a few of these games we have on both web and mobile, and their distribution of spend on the website and on the mobile are so close that it's difficult to tell the charts apart. Fundamentally, how you spend your game, how, you, how people are spending in your game is gonna be the, is gonna be the same whatever platform that you're on. And with the exception of one game, the vast majority of, uh, of our games are getting their revenue from people who are spending 100 plus or more. And it's not just Congregate, um, and it's not just our games. This is normal for the industry. So Swerve, which is an analytics and A-B testing platform, did a report back in January of 2014 where they looked at everybody playing um, and spending across all of their games using their services and found that 1.5% uh, of people active that month spent. And then when they broke them into deciles, they found that the top 10% of spenders represented half of the revenue. So 0.15% of active players were half the revenue. A little bit more, con a little bit more dif diffuse than Congregate, but not meaningfully different. And this is with a lot of games that didn't have, where the highest thing that you could buy was 1999. So while this is totally true of the industry, it's also something that we're really uncomfortable with. So uh, let's see. Did, okay. Okay. There, now I'm on the right slide. So whenever I mention that our top spenders on Congregate have spent fifty to eighty thousand dollars, people always nearly always react with a kind of this mix of um, awe and horror. And people, you know, a lot of there's a lot of criticism for free to play games and ethics. And one of the things that they quickly jump on is the amount that the biggest spenders are spending, and they start questioning. Are these people sane? Are they being, are, you know, are developers some kind of predator that's, you know, ripping money from these people? And it's not just ethical concerns. Um, people worry that free-to-play games are too financially dependent on just a few people, so much so that Zynga listed it um, as a risk in their IPO prospectus. Now, from my perspective, pretty much every business is dependent on good customers, so um, I don't think it's much of a risk, but um, Zynga certainly thought, thought so and, um, and, and publicized it. So to better understand what's going on here, um, I, uh, I think it makes sense to take a look at who's buying. Um, this chart shows aver average revenue per user, or ARPU, on congregate.com um, by the, the reported age of the user at registration, um, or reported the, the birth date reported at registration and whatever age they are now. So young users spend very little on average with spend rising gradually um, uh, through college age, um, rapidly increasing after they graduate, and then plateauing through um, a middle age when disposable income is at its highest. Um, there's some weird little sharp dips at 25 and 35, um, and that's probably driven by people putting in fake January 1, 1980 and 1990 um, birth dates, because those are exactly 15, 15 and, uh, sorry, 25 and 35 years ago now. Um, the, there's also an issue with people um, with the ages over than 57, because our registration form um, um, anchors at 1940, and everything from age 57 or older is um, immediately visible, so probably has a high portion of people who are just putting in random ages. But um, just looking at the core data from 13 through 57, you can still see a really clear, uh, really clear trend, um, and um, in terms of what's going on, um, you can see a little bit more of what's going on if you decompose ARPU between percentage of buyers and the average revenue um, per paying user or ARPU. Uh, the young uh, is that my computer? Okay. Um, the youngest players generally don't have a way of playing, of paying, uh, no credit cards or PayPal accounts. Um, but the percent of players um, who are buying rises rapidly um, with age and independence, so and then plateauing um, through the 30s before just starting to decline in the 40s. Um, I suspect that you know people in their 40s now are kind of the first generation that grew up with video games, and so familiarity and comfort with video games is a little bit lower past that age. Um, the increase in ARPAPU, though, is much more gra gradual and peaks in the late 40s um, and early 50s. Again, ignore um, most of the data from, um, from, from age 50. Yep, that's distorted by um, the registration process. Um, what is clear, though, is that spending grows first with the ability to pay and then the means to pay. 
Um, this chart shows uh, um, U.S. Uh, disposable income by educational attainment and age. And if you look at sort of the 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 angle of this chart and the growth of disposable income over age, it really mirrors um, the ARPAPU growth very closely. Um, people are spending what they can afford to spend. Uh, so this chart um, is uh, delving a little bit more granularly into our big spenders and is takes our top 20 spenders lifetime on congregate.com and sorts them um, from youngest to oldest. The youngest is 24. The oldest is 68. Both the average and median age of big spenders is 40. Um, the older big spenders um, all come from the U.S. and Western Europe, while the few younger spenders come from more assorted countries. The little red um, flag with a flower is Hong Kong. Um, you can also see Brazil and the United Arab Emirates um, and Sweden are the, are, are the people, are the spenders um, who are under 30. Um, and our customer service team has um, spoken on the phone or emailed with every single person on this list, um, both to check that there was nothing fraudulent going on and then to also help them with various uh, in-game customer service issues and issues that arise when you, know, you spend that much money. And they say that... Um, Every time they talk to them, they're sort of impressed by sort of the politeness and um, reasonableness of, um, of all of these top 20 spenders. Um, a lot of them own their own businesses. Some are engineers. Um, there's a doctor with the CEC uh, and um, CPAs and similar. These are sort of older, um, competent, professional people. The columns um, also show how much they spend and then breaks it out into uh, what, what games they're spending it in. So that first blue part is the, their, their main game um, that has the most spend. The red is their second game, and then there's a few more colors for other games. And one of the things that you can see really clearly here is that most of these uh, players are spending um, most of their money on one game. They may be buying in other games, um, but they're, they're really concentrating their resources in one game. The, the phenomenon of a serial um, big spender who's going in and dropping significant amounts of cash uh, in game after game is really rare. I think there's only sort of two, maybe three people who, out of this 20, who show that pattern. Um, so now I'm going to jump into a different uh, um, look at the data and um, start looking at one particular game. Because once you start looking at gameplay patterns, it makes much more sense to look at an individual game. Um, the next series of slides are all going to be data from Tyrant Unleashed, which is a game we publish on mobile and web um, from Synapse Games. And thank you again, Synapse, for uh, once more letting me share a lot of your data. So um, this chart uh, it takes a little while to look through, but it shows the average number of sessions per uh, daily active user by the day they are in the game. So from one year, um, in, some day of install in through um, a year and a half in, uh, and then breaks it by the eventual spend category that they reach. So um, if they eventually become a $500 plus spender, then they're in the line in green. If they've spent less, less than $500, they're red, non-spenders are blue. And what you can see is that from day one that the biggest spenders are much, much more active um, than anybody else in the game. Um, over their lifetime, they're averaging around 20 sessions per day, whereas lesser spenders are averaging around 12 and non-spenders around five. Um, the longer they're in the game, the more it comes together, but the pattern of you know, big spenders um, uh, are uh, twice as active as lesser spenders and then uh, twice as active again uh, from non-spenders uh, is, is pretty consistent. And people, most people who spend a long time in this game do end up spending. So uh, about a, by about a year in, um, uh, two-thirds of all active players in the game um, have spent. Um, but non-spenders aren't driven out because, um, you know, that still means a third of people uh, um, have, have played the game for a year and a half without spending. 
uh, most of them spend, um, some people spend pretty quickly. About 18% of people make their first purchase on the day of install, and about half have made their first purchase within a week of installing the game. But after that, um, it takes a long time to go up. Um, and at um, a month in, 30% um, of, the, of, of the people who are going to purchase have not yet purchased. And even six months in, um, these, these graphs are not yet at um, 100%. People are still making their first purchase, even um, people who are going to go on to spend $500 or more. Uh, as you would expect, the biggest spenders do spend a little bit earlier and a little bit faster than uh, lesser spenders, but there's not a really a big difference. People are, are a lot of big spenders are taking their time um, before they make their first purchase. And they're spending gradually over time. So this um, breaks all of the spenders um, out into deciles by, their, by um, their, the average amount that they've spent, um, and, the, and then looks at their spending um, um, by time in the game. And you can see, um, especially the first and second deciles, that their investment in the game is really, really gradual. Um, they're spending kind of the same amount every month steadily. Um, it's a little hard to see what some of the lower deciles are doing here, just because the top ones are so big. Um, but um, so I, here in this next slide, I'm taking away the top two, and you can see that that gradual investment um, um, is still happening, uh, just at a slightly less steep um, 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 angle and with a, a, a lower amount. The only groups that don't sort of rise significantly over time are the bottom deciles where people are spending $20 or less, um, and most of those are just making, you know, kind of one purchase and done. So how do you spend $5,000 in a game? Um, now I'm going to look at one individual case um, of a big spender. Um, this big spender is a 40-year-old California, Cal uh, Californian um, whose primary game is an action RPG. Uh, it's single player in a social environment um, with a lot of skill-based leveling and multiple class paths that give them a, a strong feeling of progress. Uh, there's guilds and co-op multiplayer, um, PvP and tournaments that they participate in, and they play four to six days a week. Um, play, I've played more than a thousand times lifetime, and they play and spend um, in other games, but 90% of money and time is going into the, just this one game. So you can see that that fits the sort of, you know, prototypical stereotype of the big spenders um, that we've talked, up, talked about up to this point. Um, um, what do they actually spend on? So they spent, in 2014, they spent about $7,500, uh, uh, 2200 on consumables, 1800 for skill upgrades, some miscellaneous things, and then um, the bulk of their money going towards um, um, multiplayer, competitive multiplayer, tournament skilled wars, PvP, that kind of thing. Um, so a little bit more about this um, big spender. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> and a little bit more about this big spender. I'm not spending it on a game. I'm spending it on figure skating. Uh, so uh, how does that work? Well, uh, believe it or not, there's actually an amazing parallel between um, the structure of competitive figure skating and a game. Uh, it's, this has been the structure for uh, the U U.S. Figure Skating Association since, like, 60 years, 70 years, but they, they may as well have invented gamification. So um, it's a single player sport um, um, in a social environment. Um, so um, individual sport done in a shared session. So I skate at the Yerba Buena rink that's kind of right on top of the conference center right now um, with other people um, who I get to know well and become friends with. Uh, if this makes me slightly cooler, um, one of them is occasionally Brian Boitano, um, who is a very nice guy. Uh, there's skill-based leveling, multiple class paths. Um, so um, there's five different classes in which you compete um, um, and can um, test up and level up. Um, I'm progressing along the moves in the field, um, basic skills tests, um, as well as singles um, um, freestyle. And um, I am... I've tested through three levels on moves in the field um, and on two levels on freestyle and working to level up on both. Um, and I do this by um, learning new skills, um, achievements, um, and then testing in the test session. So um, uh, say an example might be a sit spin or a flip jump or something like that. Um, there's guilds and co-op multiplayer. 
Um, so I'm a member of the Skating Club of San, Fran San Francisco. I'm also a member of a synchronized skating team. Um, and believe me, there's nothing cool about that. That's the uh, picture of me in that like red sequin vest with like something really strange in my hair. That's my synchronized skating team. Um, there's also ice dance in pairs, but I don't do that. Um, and there's uh, competitive multiplayer. So um, there's frequent competitions um, organized by age, level, and mode. Um, and points are also tallied for clubs and rinks. And that pressure is actually um, very real and very significant and is the reason why in that uh, picture there to the right, I'm dressed like a B-52. Um, uh, we were hosting a competition at my rink, and the rink manager wanted um, all of the good skaters to compete in as many events as possible so we would earn more points. Um, and um, um, she made me um, do this group routine in this particular outfit. Um, and the good news is, that, though, that we did win that trophy, and she was happy. So... Uh, so what, you know, I gave all these sort of um, uh, game equivalents to my spending. So um, uh, the consumables was my ice time. So um, just going to my daily session um, um, costs about $11. Um, I do that almost every day. Um, that adds up. Uh, the skilled upgrades are my private lessons. Um, I take a $135 half hour lesson every week. That ends up being about $1,800 a year. Um, there's some miscellaneous costs for equipment and costs. Costumes, um, but m the big bulk of money is going to competition fees and travel to get to competitions. And even with $7,500, I definitely haven't hit my max spend. Uh, I'm actually participating in relatively few competitions because I have to travel so much for Congregate already. And while I'm naturally thrifty, I'm happy to spend this money. I love skating enough that a 10% increase in my skills is worth 10x the cost. When I make this comparison, people will dis often dismiss it as being fundamentally different because skating is exercise, I can resell my skates, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, skating is good for my health, but you can see here that most of my spend is going to uh, uh, skill progression and competition, and that's exactly the thing, same things that you spend on in-game. Nothing... Well, except for the actual ice time, nothing that's listed here um, has any resale value um, or does any good for my health. Even the equipment is really services like skate sharpening and my locker. And my larger point here is that games are hobbies, and people spend a lot on their hobbies. So an uh, example would be like a weekly golfer um, could easily spend $10,000 a year on green fee greens fees and golf clubs, lessons, going to the driving range. Um, somebody who's an amateur guitarist, um, while they might not spend much day to day, um, I, I, the few that I've known tend to obsess about collecting guitars and um, you know, will go visit shops that have guitars that they like um, that they can't afford just to sort of touch and see them and usually end up spending more than they um, really want to on guitars. Uh, going to eat in restaurants adds up very quickly if you do it weekly, especially in San Francisco. Um, and baseball fans, season tickets, a, t a visit to spring training, that can be you know, 5,000 between them pretty quickly. Um, even something like, you know, your aunt does, like quilting. Um, materials get expensive pretty quickly, and it's nicer to use nice materials, so um, 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 people will spend on that. Uh, a really good sewing machine is going to cost $5,000, and if you're doing it all the time, you're going to want that. Even something that um, seems like it would be really cheap, um, relatively like, um, like running, somebody who becomes a competitive runner is likely to start spending money. Um, you, you know, you're going to go through shoes pretty quickly, and at $100, $150 a pop, you can spend $500 on shoes and clothes um, quite easily, um, especially once you start competing, race fees, and travel to races. Um, it, it adds up just the way my figure skating does. Um, so how did I get started on this path? And um, I think looking at sort of the long-term pattern of my spend kind of um, explains a lot about sort of the psychology um, and how things work. So um, I started skating in two, back in 2004. Uh, looking for an alternative exercise, uh, immediately fell in love, started taking group lessons, and my um, bought skates, and in uh, 2005 and early 2006, my spend was accelerating. Um, then in June of 2006, me and my brother and I started Congregate, um, and suddenly I had um, uh, neither money nor time. Um, we were going without salaries, and so there's about a two-year period where I was barely skating and barely spending at all. 
things stabilized um, by 2009, and I went back to sort of the trend line that I'd been on before. Uh, in 2010, we sold um, uh, Congregate to GameStop, and I used some of that money to buy custom skates. Um, and then um, they're made by the same people who make them for Brian Boitano, so again... <laughs> They're very cool. Um, and I'm still using those um, from five years ago. So um, uh, it's, it was a good investment. So, um, And then I started competing um, and joined the sync team. It jumped a lot last year when I went to compete at my first nationals. It was in Massachusetts in April. Um, I'm probably the only person who has ever combined a trip to PAX East and adult skating nationals. Um, and, um, and this year, coming year, um, I expect that I'm going to spend even more. Um, I think, you know, I'm guesstimating somewhere around $12,000. Um, uh, when I turned 40 last year, my family gave me a really, really lovely gift of uh, a trip to the Dorothy Hamill uh, Fantasy Skate Camp. Um, it was awesome, um, and I'm likely to go back and spend a week, you know, with great coaches skating for um, 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 a week again. And I can see, um, uh, I could really easily see spending, you know, say $20,000 in a year um, if I did both adult nationals and the big international competition in Germany, um, um, work with a choreographer, do things like that. So I don't know that I would do that sort of regularly, but I can very much um, see that happening and, and feel that it would be rational. Um, you know, the choices that I'm making here may seem a little unusual, um, but they've been gradual, thoughtful investments um, put to something that I love. I'd rather spend money on figure skating than almost anything else. So I'm lucky enough to have the means um, um, and disposable income um, <laughs> to, to put towards skating, um, uh, especially as I don't have kids. Um, but that's not true of all skaters um, or all gamers. Um, here's a friend that I skate with on Facebook posting about her decision not to go to nationals this year um, because her husband has lost her job and they need to, to, to budget and save. And she, she's, she's saving, but she's putting, you know, the money goes to the mortgage first and then um, health care, and then she's saving for her nephew's wedding. Um, but she's still finding enough, you know, money in the budget to, to, to skate and take lessons and sort of do the base case. Um, and then several other people are chiming in about their decision making, again, um, deciding it was too expensive to go to nationals. So um, the point here is that um, even avid, avid fans are making uh, rational, thoughtful decisions about how they're spending. Um, now, not every skater or gamer is making their spending decisions um, totally rationally and within their budget. Um, uh, n there's always a spectrum of human behavior in any group, and there's always going to be some people who are trying to fi fill unmet emotional needs um, in unhealthy ways. But we don't blame uh, department stores for the occasional compulsive shopper, um, and we shouldn't blame either figure skating or games um, for the occasional compulsive spender. Um, and it's not just figure skating, and it's not just games. Um, other game industries have similar dynamics. Um, for example, the music industry. So um, if you start with a base of radio, which is a really mass audience, and streaming and piracy, um, um, most artists are getting very little money from um, um, from these sources, um, but they're getting a lot of exposure um, um, to a broad audience um, in the hope that a smaller percentage of them are going to go on and buy either a physical or digital copy um, of um, of their music, um, and that and then from there a smaller percentage of, than that is going to go on and um, buy a ticket to go to a concert um, and maybe buy a T-shirt, um, and then there's going to be um, um, in the last few years as the uh, amount of revenue from uh, amount of people buying um, physical and digital copies of music has gone down with piracy and streaming, um, uh, artists are getting more clever um, about putting together packages, um, VIP packages, um, to um, sell sort of expensive experiences to their very highest fans. Um, so what you see there is that overall um, millions of people may be seeing, um, uh, listening to an artist's music 
but the artist's revenue is heavily concentrated in a small percent who spend twenty to five hundred dollars to go to concerts and buy merchandise. And even within that, it's probably concentrate on the repeat concert goers who are um, maybe traveling to get there, the people who buy every album, even the bad ones, um, and then again the people who are buying VIP packages. Um, I'm showing a screenshot here from one that U2 is doing. Um, that's fifteen hundred dollars um, for a ticket to the concert, um, a hotel room, and premium. Premium access, premium access to merchandise um, um, to where you can spend again um, and just the possibility of a drawing um, where you might get to meet the band. Um, so like a really low percentage chance that you might be anywhere near the band and that's $1,500. And again, it's a little closer to home as well um, in terms of the concentration. So if you look at console games, um, the dynamics are more similar than you would expect. So GameStop, um, our parent company, uh, uh, is a very hefty percentage of the U.S. market for video games. And they re they've reported publicly that 20% of their customers are members of Power Up Rewards, um, which is their loyalty database. And 70%, uh, but the 70% of their revenue is coming from those 20% of, uh, of customers who are loyalty members. And even within that, um, it's more densely packed. So um, there's two tiers of Power Up Rewards membership. There's the free one, um, where you just kind of give over your information and you get an immediate discount, and you can you're earning points that you can um, potentially redeem um, for things in their in their loyalty store. And then there's a pro version, which costs $15 um, and gets you a copy of Game Informer magazine, larger discounts, and double the points. Um, as you would imagine, anybody who's going to spend $15 on a, on a membership is a really good customer. And so the people in the basic free tier, um, on average, um, buy from GameStop three times a year, spend $160. Um, the people in the pro um, buy uh, 10 times on average um, and spend $570. And that's just their spend um, um, within GameStop. They're probably spending on Steam and other places. Uh, now the number, uh, the breakout um, between um, uh, basic and pro on power up members is not a public number, but you can make a guess that it's got to be, you know, less than 10% of the GameStop audience and somewhere in the 40 to 50% range of total revenue. So, uh, if this kind of distribution and this kind of setup is totally normal, why are we so uncomfortable with big spenders and free-to-play games? Um, so uncomfortable that we quickly jump to mental illness and um, bad behavior by game on, on the game developer's part to explain it. So, I think there's several reasons. Um, one is data. Um, before free-to-play, we really uh, we really didn't know how much people were spending. Um, it was scattered across mul multiple sources, and those sources were generally retailers and platform holders. Um, until recently, I doubt that the retailers um, themselves knew. I worked in data analysis um, um, and marketing for several retail companies before we started Congregate. And though we used to, at that time, we knew almost everything about customers who are buying through catalogs and web. But if we looked at, um, if we wanted any data from the store, it was always just anonymous transaction data. And there was no way to figure out um, who was um, purchasing again and again. An individual store manager might know who their big customer was, big customers were and what they were spending on average. Um, but it took loyalty programs, um, which really took off in the last 10 years or so, um, for people at the retail level to really understand um, and collect this kind of data. And even once they had it, you know, they were probably reasonably comfortable with it um, because this kind of concentration is normal um, regardless of what you sell. Um, I have a funny story about um, Larry um, Ellison from a previous company that I probably shouldn't tell publicly, but um, if you ever catch me, um, uh, not at a podium, uh, I will tell you what it is. So... Um, Reason two um, is that spend is more concentrated, and you know we should be honest about that. Um, uh, it's co more concentrated, and the biggest spending spenders are spending more. So this table shows off uh, the dynamics of mobile and web markets, uh, starting with a base case of a paid mobile app. Um, these numbers are all made up, so you know don't read too closely into them. Um, but I think, but um, you know, I have enough data that I feel like these are pretty plausible as sort of you know above median um, 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 cases, but sort of way below actual um, the the real successes. 
Uh, in the current mobile market, it's really hard to get much of anyone to buy a game. Um, there's just too much free content. Um, when you go free, installs can explode, but conversion goes down and lives in a relatively narrow range. So, so what ends up mattering is not is whether um, players keep keep playing and keep spending and drive the average amount spent up. And that's why free-to-play is generating more revenue than paid. It's not because more people are getting into your game um, and having a chance to convert. Um, generally, you're going to have fewer buyers um, than you would have otherwise. And, but I think people think that that's what the dynamic is, that you know, you're getting more people in who might buy. Um, uh, the total number of people is, uh, buying is almost certainly going down because the more casually interested um, are not going to pay unless they have to. Um, it's the reason that total revenue is up is because the most invested players, um, who in a paid world spent the same as every as, as everyone else, um, are now have their spend uncapped. Um, so some people who would have uh, spent before enjoy the game for free, and the most invested invested spend much more than they would have, essentially subsidizing a free experience for everybody else. Um, reason three is that we don't value digital games very highly. Um, so I've put together a chart, again, with some good numbers um, from MPD and some really, really shitty numbers um, um, for paid PC games that are um, um, somewhat made up but somewhat plausible um, um, after talking to um, uh, PC developers. So um, take it with a grain of salt. But the, the range of prices um, um, and, and sort of the, the general dynamics of total market size are probably pretty accurate. So um, console games have better graphics and more content to play through than um, most PC games or um, definitely most mobile games. But the um, average player only, sm only plays a small portion of that content. Completion rates on even the, the best games on console tend to, to be around 30%, I believe. Um, well, some mobile, P mobile and PC games are quite short. You know, Monument Valley is pretty darn short, for example. The delta between play times is likely a lot less than the delta in price. Uh, is a new console game really worth four to five times the average PC game, 20 to 25 times the average paid mobile game? You know, I'm biased because I'm in that space, but I don't really think so. Um, and the other thing is, again, these numbers are rough, but the market size of each of these um, genres, um, not genres, platforms, um, marches roughly in step with the average sales price of a game. Um, though in theory, mobile and PC, PC should be larger than console games because um, they're platforms that have much broader reach. Everybody, almost everybody has a computer, almost everybody has a smartphone. Um, so why um, is price mattering more than the number of possible players? And that's because I believe demand for games is fundamentally inelastic. Um, um, so what inelastic means is that when the price drops, the total amount um, sold increases, but not enough to, to account to make up for the drop in price. So total revenue is lower. And I know you're thinking, okay, um, that doesn't make any sense at all. If that's true, why do PC game developers make so much more when they're part of Steam sales and Humble Bundle? Clearly, price is dropping and their revenue is going up. But when you think about it, um, that's what's going on is a sale and a special event. And they're getting a lot more pr promotion. If you drop the price um, without um, um, giving them a lot more attention and putting a perception in the mind of the player that they're getting this amazing limited time deal, um, the revenue wouldn't, for these games wouldn't go up at that same price. They would go down. Um, Steam sales help draw more people into, into play PC games, which, it, which increases the sale for that category overall and exposes consumers to a lot broader range of games and developers, which overall is really good for the industry. Um, but it's probably mostly cannibalizing revenue that would otherwise have gone to console. So pricing studies have consistently shown that we make our decisions based on our perceived sense of value rather than price alone. And interestingly, price itself is a signal of, of, of value to most of us. So we assume that if, if the price being charged is higher, the item must be better. So um, if you see a higher priced wine, your default assumption is that it's better wine. 
you don't have really any way to know that, but the price is giving you that signal. Um, if you go into a drugstore and you see um, a brand name like Aleve right next to the Walgreens uh, naproxen sodium, those are exactly the same things, and yet people, and this includes me, have a tendency to go reach over and buy the Aleve because it must be better because it's more expensive. But it's really the same thing. So on mobile, um, we have anchored our perception of value really low. Hey, how much for them jazz thousand dollars? So, yo, we gotta get this new app. It's free. What? No, no, no. <laughs> um, so we're all familiar with the terrible race to the bottom on paid game pricing that happened on iOS a few years back. Um, there was no retail or platform who cared about the total sales to organize and control price wars, and the going price for games was quickly pushed down to 99 cents. Um, games that you can play for many hours are priced at, at or below a cup of coffee or the cost of renting a movie that lasts 90 minutes. Um, a few games can come in at higher prices, like Minecraft or Final Fantasy Tactics, um, when their value has been anchored high on another platform. Um, and prices are slowly creeping up again. Um, $3.99 is more common, $4.99 is more common. But for paid games to be viable for, for, for more developers, prices need to, to rise a lot, um, among other things, that, so that sale events can be more meaningful. A $0.99 cent drop um, may be 50% on a $1.99 game, um, but it's not going to get a lot of people excited. So that's why you know, free-to-play is so strong in the mobile market. Free-to-play games set their own value. In a free-to-play game, nobody can sell a good that's useful except you, which makes your game a little monopoly. It's an insecure monopoly, though, because the player can leave at any time, and if you piss them off by um, um, pricing things in really weird and aggressive ways, they are likely to leave. There's no point price shopping um, uh, packages of gold between games or the value of any kind of premium currency. Um, the other game's items have no meaning in the game that you're playing. The more compelling and engaging the game, the more that players care about their status and progress, the high, and the higher the value of the goods in the game um, become to the player, and the higher you can set your prices. Which comes um, to the next reason why I, that I think is affecting our perception of big spenders, which is that we don't value virtual goods. Our brains easily pin value on physical options, uh, physical objects, sorry. Um, part of the reason console games have been able to continue to anchor their value high relative to digital versions is that disk. But that disk has been a tiny percentage of the cost of selling a console game for a very long time. It's the, dev it's the development, it's the retail share, it's the marketing. That's what's driving the cost up on just about everything. Um, um, but even out of context, physical goods um, are always per perceived as having value. Um, but out of context of playing a game, virtual items have no meaning. They're incredibly abstract. Um, and therefore, it's almost imp impossible for us to value something that we've never interacted with and never imagined. A physical good, we, we always assume it has uh, a value because it, always, it had a cost to produce. So I think this is a, uh, a large part of the success of Skylanders, for example, um, is that it bridges that gap between physical and virtual value. So a parent can go into a store and buy something that looks like something that they understand um, and give it to their child, who then converts it into a virtual item that has a lot more meaning to them. So um, another example is that spending five to ten thousand dollars on a specialized P PC gaming rig um, that improves your skill and your competitiveness in a um, um, highly competitive game like um, League of Legends um, can easily cost five to ten thousand dollars, and it's fundamentally the same as spending five to ten thousand dollars on um, um, skills and other things that um, in a virtual game that would improve your competitiveness. Um, but I bet you all find it a lot easier to contemplate and and accept. Um, if you walked into this room, you're much more likely to say, wow, um, than what were you thinking. Um, but uh, um, if, they'd, if the same person had spent that same money in game, um, you would be a little bit more concerned. Um, for the person who's spending in game, um, these items have context and they have equal value. And just because you haven't experienced it um, doesn't make it less valid. 
Um, so reason five is that I don't think we value games equally with other hobbies. Here's a, a lovely um, anti-game and um, uh, slightly misogynistic quote from Ray Bradbury along that topic. Um, and we don't value it not only with other hobbies or even other f forms of entertainment. Um, a few weeks ago, I was looking for a comprehensive history of games going back to ancient times, and I was surprised to find that, that one does not appear to have been written. Most universities have entire departments uh, devoted to studying literature, film, and theater with virtually nothing about games, but we've been playing games back to thousands of years um, BC and playing um, and spending just as much time on them, and yet we don't, we don't give them sort of any credence in an intellectual way. Um, games are a waste of time, um, games are for kids, um, uh, games aren't art, all of those things um, are sort of this sort of backbeat of, of culture. Uh, it's not hard for me to talk uh, about my obsession with figure skating with non-skaters. People generally think that it's kind of quirky and charming, that I even that I care about something that uh, um, is a little strange. Caring about sports, even unusual sports, where you're wearing sequins and makeup and play music, is broadly accepted. Um, but if it were a game that I was spending that much money on, um, I think I'd be more defensive, um, especially with non-gamers. The bias against games is so insidious that even within the in in industry, we've internalized it enough that we question someone with means spending tens of thousands of dollars on a game, especially when you combine it with the low value we place on mobile and PC games, um, and especially virtual goods. And so people jump to explanations like mental illness or evil games manipulating players when the real explanation is that they are rational, wealthy people um, who are dedicated fans of a particular game and investing in their progress in it. Um, so please don't call them whales. Uh, call them hobbyists, call them super fans, call them something else. Um, uh, to call them whales is to dehumanize them. Um, to talk of catching them suggests that, w that they're blundering into your net or somebody else's net, um, rather than choosing to spend um, their time and money in a game. And if we as developers don't respect our players and the value that we create, who will? So, um, thank you. Uh, thanks. Everybody. Uh, a lot of people helped me with their, this talk, so thank you to them. Um, I will post um, this talk, and I've posted most of the other ones that I've done, um, and other ones from Congregate People on our blog. Um, we've got a booth in the expo this time, so if you'd like to talk to us, um, 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 please stop by there. Though I'm happy to talk to people um, afterwards. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, um, at Emily G and Congregate Devs, and I'm happy to take some questions now. Thank you. Hi, I did have one question. Mm -hmm. um, Every example you used for hobbies, uh -huh. um, the uh, cost of the individual items for the hobbies is clear. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you go to the sporting goods store, you know exactly what the cost is of your skates. Yep. You know, uh, you go to GameStop, you know exactly what the cost of Call of Duty is. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that it changes uh, the um, model when there's an obfuscation of cost where um, you're using hard currency or gotcha, where it becomes much, much harder to know what the actual value is of the things that you're purchasing? Um, I don't think it. Uh, I don't think it changes it that much. Um, um, for one thing, uh, most of these spenders are sort of very rational, careful optimizers. Um, Ubisoft did a good talk last year um, where they did uh, a lot of sort of social science research into um, uh, their biggest spenders in one particular game and found out that they were, you know, very careful, um, um, thoughtful people who are maximizing certain things. Um, it, it makes the um, with gotcha boxes, the individual result of a particular pull may be uncertain, um, but the the sort of total value of what you um, um, are likely to get um, um, at the end of it um, is pretty clear. Um, and people who are spending that much are thinking it through. Um, and you know. I would say that you know when I got into figure skating, I had no idea how much I would spend. Um, and even the first time going into nationals, there were all sorts of sort of hidden and unexpected costs where I had to you know suddenly pay for um, 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 warm up time and other things. I think you know every time you're making a choice, you're looking at it um, um, on the face of it. And while you may 
you may be playing a gotcha box with the intention of get, getting one particular item. If the game is doing it right, um, then every time you pull it, you're getting something that you value. So um, you should be feeling like, I got a good deal with this gotcha pull, even if I didn't get what I wanted. I think um, that sort of framework of how we, we think about designing free-to-play um, is actually part of sort of the, the humanized um, idea of spenders and spending that um, if we're thinking about everybody as sort of rational and thoughtful, um, um, then we should be thinking about how they feel immediately about purchasing and, um, and doing it in a way um, where they f it, it feels right every time. I'm not saying that that's exactly what's happening in every game, um, but for somebody to keep spending again and again and again, they must be feeling that they're getting a good value. Variable ratio reinforcement and like you know that's a, a hook that does keep people going because it's it's a compelling feature that's hard to step away from. It's you know that's what makes video slots work mm -hmm. so well. And, and the top five of the top games in the top twenty five are yeah. straight up. Games. So what I would say is um, uh, you're buying an experience. If you're enjoying that experience, then you're getting the value of it. So um, I don't think saying something an element that makes it more enjoyable for you to play um, and enjoyable to spend, that's making the game into a spend, is part of the entertainment of what you're doing. Um, and we should trust that that is, um, that the person is making that decision um, 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 and enjoying it at that level. Again, as I mentioned, spend tends to be extremely even across time periods, um, which you know shows that you know people are having sort of controlled reactions um, and think, thinking thoughtfully about what they're spending. So. Do you think it makes a moral difference for the games that purposefully try to get those really top end spenders to make more purchases, like psychological things in the game that sort of try to pinch them in and try to just almost force them to buy something to continue for those really high-end spenders? Um, I think the games that do that are driving away their big spenders. Um, I think that um, uh, the feeling of being forced to do something is sort of one of the most unpleasant, uh, uh, unpleasant ways that you can go about monetizing, um, and uh, that games that do that are probably um, actually don't have the highest number of spenders. Like you want positive incentives like competition um, um, uh, and um, and and uh, to um, to drive spending. I don't think pinch like pinch points are not a terrible, from my perspective, not a terribly effective way of monetizing, and not really directed at um, big spenders. I think pinch points tend to be about getting $5 from everybody, like you get to a certain point, and now we're going to get that first $5, or you can leave. And as you saw, you know, somebody spending $5 or $10 once um, doesn't add up to very much in the long term, and so I think that kind of monetization um, is a mistake. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if any of your data shows that if a similar genre of game was introduced into your market, if there was a siphoning of spending towards that new game, or if uh, there was some sort of loyalty to a game that was already invested, like people were investing in. Um, there's intense loyalty. Um, uh, the uh, so. When we started, you know, we have this broad platform where we're advertising a lot of games. And when we first started having games be successful, one of our concerns was um, if we show somebody another game, are we going to just cannibalize sales and move them across? And what we find is that, you know, our sales have kind of increased really steadily over the years because people find the games that they really care about and they spend in those and they stay in those. Um, and it's relatively rare to sort of shake them from that loyalty. Um, again, you saw that in that big spender data that most people had one game that they, they spent on. Um, the situation where that's not true um, is where, uh, you know, a game isn't being supported um, and sort of the content um, has gotten, isn't, isn't, the, New content isn't being released. Um, the sort of the event cycle is died. There's not any new features. At that point, there is a vulnerable point where if a good new game and that same genre comes in, then you will see sort of a bunch of people jump over. But generally, um, if somebody is spending, um, especially is spending a significant amount in the game, um, they're not leaving. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Emily. Great talk. Um, so you mentioned that in the games, uh, you have the 
the ability to really anchor um, mm -hmm. your own prices. Mm -hmm. um, but as we see more and more games of the same genre coming mm -hmm. out with the same types of mm -hmm. purchases going on, do you mm -hmm. think that's going to put at risk that that like the competition can now anchor the price, say, of like your hero or something? Um, I think it may do. For, it may may influence it for that first purchase, mm -hmm. um, and certainly I think it's we've seen it most in card games where. Cards are amongst the easiest things to sort of understand buying and to compare. So, um, we'll, you know, we'll see a card games that come out that are pricing cards at, you know, more like seven and ten dollars, and then there'll be the complaint, no, so magic, um, prices it at this, et cetera. Um, but those games still do well. Essentially, um, what happens is then, you know, if you're, if you're price comparing, um, you probably, you know, you're already probably not um, loving the game, um, and by the time that you have spent more time in it, um, again, you know, you value that card more um, um, than that other game. Um, I think I do think that it's important to keep um, sort of um, prices. There's sort of like a, a, a careful, happy band between um, high enough that um, you're not just sort of kind of giving away money because. Um, you know, things are um, uh, uh, sort of inelastic. Um, but you also don't want to, you never want the player to feel that they're being taken advantage of or that they're being, um, um, they're not getting good value. And that's what you should con always concentrate on is that feeling of value. Um, and you probably want to keep things more at like, you know, 15 or $20 to spend, but you get a lot of stuff and you feel really great. Like to me, that's how it should be working. Cool. Thank you. Lovely talk. Thank you. Um, I am curious, it, I, I suspect I know where you're headed with this, but your thoughts on the paid incentive advertising, such as some of the services that the, the mobile publisher I was with would use, and whether you think that's a good concept from the advertiser's standpoint as opposed from the company making revenue from it. Um, I, no, I, I think well executed, they're great. Um, I think it's important to design them in ways that they're not competing um, directly with um, um, what you would actually spend in-app purchase on. Um, we've done we've done some A-B tests and seen where um, if we made our offers more prominent overall, and they did, we'd see an increase in offer revenue and then a total decrease. Um, but I don't think it has to be that way. Um, one great example is our most recent game, Adventure Capitalist. Um, I don't know if you've played that game. Um, but most of the, the in-app um, purchases are sort of speed-ups of, you know, 3x permanent speed-ups. Um, but you can get a, um, a, a, four, a 2x four-hour speed-up just by watching an ad. Um, and I go into that game, and it's just part of sort of the optimization that I do every time is that I watch an ad. I'm really happy to see it. We get a lot of, like, lots of complaints from, um, um, from players saying, oh, my ads aren't working, because they really like the system. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing really good results on the in-app purchases. So I think, um, you know, if designed well, they're very complementary. Um, but it is important to think about, you know, sort of the relative value of one ad versus something somebody spending um, um, two or three dollars. Thank you. Cool. Great. Uh, it's three o'clock, so I have to get down anyway. Mm -hmm.